All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of AppySec Presents. I'm really excited to have these super interesting uh, gentlemen on the call today. We're going to be talking about um, integrating API security into the software development lifecycle. Really interesting topic, actually, and recognizes the fact that um, APIs are a whole new breed of, of threat, a whole new breed of risk. And I think for development teams, for security teams, there's a real need to recognize that this is different and we need to protect against API risks with new techniques, new approaches, and new ideas. And the nature of APIs are, it's application centric and the nature of the exploits are often in the application itself. It's an authorization exploit, a logic exploit, and all that just means we need to start integrating security right up front into how the code is getting written, how it's being tested, how it's being deployed and so forth. So really extremely grateful to have Jason Weiss, former chief software officer at the US DOD. I didn't even know that title existed. So excited to learn more about that. And now the managing director and founder of Digital Triad Group. Also got Bill Jones, the senior practice director over at SoftRams. Great company, and he brings an incredible expertise, not only in cybersecurity, but specifically around, around API security. So we're going to be talking about how do we weave in security as early as possible into the software lifecycle. We're going to be talking about the Secure Software Development Framework, SSDF, something that I think everyone on this call should get to know. But to kick things off, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what you're up to? These yeah, days? absolutely. Thanks, Dan, for the invitation and, and excited to be here with you and Bill and talk about this subject. So I am the, presently, I'm the, the co-founder of a company called Digital Triad Group. The company was founded specifically to focus on secure software development education and certification built around the NIST SP800-218 or the Secure Software Development Framework. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll dive into that, what the SSDF is more as we get going. Uh, I'm also actually an executive advisor over at, at SoftRams. It is, as you has alluded to, it is, is a tremendous company. So excited to be affiliated with SoftRams as well. In my recent past, I was the DOD chief software officer in the office of the secretary of defense. This was a, a policy role. It wasn't a hands-on keyboard slinging code role. The teams that I worked with there, we were responsible for authoring the DoD software modernization strategy that was ultimately signed out and put into effect by Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks. We also had with that team responsibility for the DevSecOps reference designs that the DoD software factories would use, driving things like Kubernetes and containers and best practices. We had a great venue called the DevSecOps Community of Practice. Each month we'd get DoD folks together to talk specifically around software development, modern software development, microservices, containers, et cetera, et cetera. And before that, I held some leadership roles, SVP, VP roles at a number of different multinational companies as well. So that's me in a nutshell. All right on. Appreciate that. Bill, let us get to know you a little bit. I am currently the practice director of the security practice at SoftRams. As you can see behind me, I tinker around with a lot of technology pretty much every single day. So I'm probably as nerdy as it gets, but I'm very passionate about security. I'm always watching for emerging technologies that can assist and help our security engineers tackle tomorrow's problems. So at SoftRams, we literally do redefine, or we are redefining the digital frontier. We do a lot of work throughout federal agencies. And with that work, uh, obviously, it's going to come a lot of API creations and API utilization. So the SDF and SDLC apply a whole lot to what we're doing. So looking forward to speaking today and continuing the discussion to raise awareness around these two areas and to help others learn and grow as well. I appreciate both of you being here. And, and, and so we'll come back to you, Jason. When we were chatting the other day, I was, I was surprised to hear some of the pain points that you had at uh, the DOD and other organizations and how relatable they were to conversations we have with small companies, large companies, everything in between. I mean, I don't think that gets any bigger than the DOD. And I can't even imagine what sort of, what it's like to manage in an environment that large, but you shared some of the standard pain points, adoption of gateways and resistance that, that you ran into and 
driving documentation throughout the organization and tensions between, is it an internal API? Is it an external API? Do we need to, to care as much if it's internal T's and so forth? So I'm, I'm curious to get a little color from you on kind of things that, that you ran into, even at a great big organization like that, and, and how it's not maybe so different than what a lot of folks on the call are dealing with day to day. Yeah, happy to. I usually caveat answering this type of question with the trials and tribulations at an entity like the Department of Defense are, are really a mirror of the trials and tribulations that most companies in the private sector also have. It's not really a unique set of circumstances per se when it comes to the problems that you're trying to solve. I think what is different about a highly regulated environment, something like the Department of Defense is we have different categorizations for our network. So a production network, you're not allowed to, to run development tools. What does that mean? Take Git. Git as a tool, as a protocol. You can't use Git on a production environment. That has to be over in a research and a development environment. Even doing something as simple as pulling down a markdown repository that has the latest Salsa documentation in ASCII format, it's a little bit trickier to do in a highly constrained environment like that. What you end up seeing is when you look broadly across the organization, there are locations that have been there for quite literally decades, like any large multinational that has been in existence for a very long time. You have legacy systems. And some of those legacy systems don't incorporate things like API gateways. They don't use JSON web tokens, for example. And so actually securing those endpoints, thinking about the APIs that are in those systems and managing those can be quite a daunting task. There's not a lot of levers that you can pull in a regulated environment like the federal government because we have what's known as color of money. So when you have money that is allocated for sustaining the operations of a system, you can't legally use that money to go install something like an API gateway or add an extra layer of cybersecurity as easily as you might think. If the powers that be deem that action is development and you use sustainment dollars to do that, you're literally violating federal law. So it, it gets a little bit tricky in these environments. And the more forethought and education that you can do across the community, much as we're doing here today to help folks understand these are the best practices. If, if you're doing new development, start here. Don't replicate the way that it was in the past. But that's probably the, the best answer that I could give is that there are trials and tribulations, but they're not necessarily software architecture trials and tribulations. And I imagine that a lot of that experience inspired you to get involved with the creation of the SSDF. And so I want to share a bit of background here, and, and maybe you can walk us through this, this slide here of the evolution of software and how does that bring us to the secure software development framework? Yeah, glad to. So the folks over at NIST have done an amazing job and they continue to, to drive hard to create these different standards that really benefit all of us. And while I was never in direct employ of NIST, I, like so many of us on this call, benefit from the standards that they put out. What we're seeing develop in the market is pretty interesting. If we think about in the 1990s, for example, software was evaluated based on its functional experience. If the software could do something particular, some algorithm, then it could be down selected and potentially purchased and deployed in an organization. And that was that. You would figure everything else out after the fact. When the iPhone came about in 2007 and shortly thereafter, in my opinion, we saw the second turning point of software experience. Instead of it being a single axis that software was evaluated against, we saw an X and a Y axis take shape where we would look at the functional experience, the ability of the software to still do something that we needed help with was important, but so too was user aesthetics. We actually saw the user experience and these aha moments that it was possible to deploy applications without manuals, without requiring a week of training to learn how to sign on to the application or create your account. 
And so that really has been the norm for the past decade. Software was really evaluated based on two different criteria, the user experience and the functional experience. What we're seeing come into fruition today, and a lot of this is because of the pervasive nature and what is only can be described as an all of nation problem. And the nation here could be the United States, India, South Korea, pick your nation. <laughs> We're all suffering from massive and aggressive cyber attacks every day. Even here on my home firewall, I see a lot of attacks try to come in and it's, it, it really is daunting. It's getting worse. The ransomware, the phishing attacks, the zero day exploits, the APTs, uh, and even folks trying to poke around at the APIs and, and just figure out what can they do with the APIs that are already publicly exposed and opened through that firewall. And what we're seeing here is a shift in the market to what I call the third turning point of the software experience. And that is the introduction of the security experience, where now we're looking at functional and user. Those are still important, but so too is the security experience that software portrays. And we see governments issuing a lot of guidance. In fact, since the, uh, the United States Executive Order 14028 signed by President Biden, since the U.S. put that executive order out there, there's been this flurry of activity that has really led to over a thousand pages of guidance from the federal government across all the usual agencies, the National Security Agency, CISA, uh, FBI, Department of Homeland Security. Everybody is putting out guidance to try and help us understand what secure is supposed to look like, including what secure endpoints are supposed to look like. And that really has driven the attention and a lot of folks looking towards the NIST SP-800-218, the SSDF, as this guiding document to help drive home that the security experience now matters. And I appreciate the, the journey, right? And, and it, it absolutely makes sense. And I, you talked about software started as functional focus, right? Does it deliver the capability that we're looking at. And then with the iPhone and others, we started worrying about the look and feel, the user experience, and, and now security getting woven in. And we see this gap a lot where, you know, it, development teams and security teams have been too siloed from each other. And I was just talking to a guy at a bank who's been tasked with API security initiatives, and, and he was asking for advice on what should he be thinking about? What should he be doing? And I said, first thing you got to do is go get to know the, the development team. Yeah, you've got to get over there. And if you think about the kinds of things that were working before, injection attacks and cross-site and buffer overflows, these are security vulnerabilities, if you will. But the things that are getting breached now at the API level is logic. And it's raw functionality that's now getting exposed. And I think we've had an issue where We've had an over-reliance on user interfaces to be not just presentation layers, but security enforcement. The UI can control what you can see and what buttons you can press, but you remove the UI from the equation and now you're going straight to the APIs. And if the API was returning all the data and the UI was filtering it, now you're just getting unfiltered data. And, the, and so we're seeing this desperate need to see security teams really collaborate with dev teams in ways that I don't think we've seen before and certainly is, is much needed. And so segueing from this evolution, that I think has helped drive the, the need for and the creation of the SSDF. And so I want folks on, on the call to really understand like, what is this and what does it mean for them and why they should care? Like you're coming from a, a DOD background, but you know, for the health tech companies and the, and the fintechs and the telcos on the call, like this is relevant to them. So help us understand this SSDF. What is it? Who does it apply to? What's, what's it made of? Sure. So the SDF, it consists of four different broad groups or umbrellas. And as you can see on the screen, it's about preparing the organization to actually be productive in their software development journey, producing that well-secured software, 
protecting it, and then responding to the vulnerabilities after it's in production. And what the SSDF does to accomplish these things is it defines practices, and then inside those practices, there are collections of tasks. In cumulative, the SSDF has 42 practices, and some of them are quite common sense, but hard to, to respond. So for example, what are your security requirements for your infrastructure? What are your security requirements for your API? If you don't actually have that captured somewhere, you don't know if you're actually meeting the mark. You're not able to measure that with your tooling and your CI CD pipeline. And I think people often will conflate the agile manifesto, which says that, you know, you should prefer this value of delivering value over documentation. It doesn't say don't ever do documentation. That's not what the Agile Manifesto is espousing. So the SSDF is important. Why should you care about it? The federal government is using their buying power to force this on the industry. And you may go, I don't sell to the direct, I don't sell directly to the US government. So this is not my problem. And this is where things get a little bit interesting. And we start to see how the government can influence the private sector. What the executive order and OMB has issued in their memo as M2218 is guidance to the totality of the government that says if you buy anything with software, firmware, embedded, or application, regardless of the deployment location, whether it's running in a cloud, on a phone, or in a car, that software must have been built, designed, built, implemented, and rolled out using the 42 security controls found in the SSDF. So in practical terms, what does that mean? It means if I'm looking to buy a microwave for the break room in a VA hospital, that microwave and the firmware inside of it and the digital display that counts down how long the microwave should be running must be attested to following the SSDF. And, and the government is holding firm all software. So even if you make and design systems on a chip that you sell to who knows who, you may face as a supplier a pass down requirement that says, hey, you need to attest that you're following the SSDF because three layers down on the value chain, we're actually selling this product that has your system on a chip to the government. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Bill, maybe this is a good chance to, to to bring you in here. I know the SSDF in a lot of detail, but maybe double click on some of these these four areas and help us understand. I guess there are, there's more behind this. If folks go to the NIST page, they can actually learn more about the PO requirement, the PW requirements, and so forth. So maybe give us a little bit more color on each of these four sure. items. Sure. So it's interesting because uh, Jason's talking about documentation and the SSDF is. It's a 47 pages, I think it's not too lengthy, but there's a lot of information in there to memorize it all. I don't, I wouldn't recommend trying to memorize it all. I would take it in sections at a time. And I think prepare the organization as the very first step is a really good first step because it focuses specific to the organizational needs, the people, the processes, and the technologies used within the organization. And that's what powers every single organization. So how do we address that while touching on the practice groups? And so what Jason mentioned earlier with the infrastructure as a, a direction there, and it's how do you secure your infrastructure? Being in the security realm and having to write this type of documentation, we need to know every single detail down to the, the MAC address with an IP address. We have to know all of the information, but how do we outline that in documentation? So that's a discussion that needs to take place. And that discussion isn't just security. It is the entirety of the organization. That's why people are listed in that requirement. So everyone has to partake and give information back into that. And the second one here I'll, I'll look at is to protect the software from tampering. Like I said, I like to tamper with devices all the time. I love some gadgets that you can put as like man of the middle devices to mess around with the, the calls to USBs and cars and other devices that have open ports. And the SSDF is to help build that secure environment, which will eventually render 
a much more secure software that is delivered. And in our case, it's APIs that we're delivering and we want to be able to attest that those APIs are secure. So through that, how are we securing our APIs? You have to ask a lot of open-ended questions internally to be able to fill in these tasks within the SSDF. And it's not a one and done thing, which I'll come back to in a minute, but the, the produced well-defined software is, as an organization, we've discussed this, we've all come together, we've all agreed on this, we're all performing education and where we have awareness that is within the organization. And now we've gotten to the point to where We've matured as an organization enough that we can take on the zero trust methodologies. And then we're going to discuss how do we implement that and what is the best approach for this organization to do. And that's another key point that I really appreciate out of the SSDF is that you're not forced into a direction. It's loosely written so that it, what works best for your organization is acceptable. And I think to that point, it's, do you at least have something in place for each of these areas to attest that you have done this and that your software has been basically bolstered more secure from the get-go? And then responding to vulnerabilities. I respond to vulnerabilities on a daily basis. And so having the organization within each of these practices and moving forward the vulnerability you would expect to decrease. And that's your measurement gauge. Are the practices that we've implemented and the tasks that we've defined and outlined and everything that we've written to secure our final output, is it working? And if it's not, we need to go back and, and rethink and refocus, but we need to do that as an organization with everyone included. So that's how I view all four of these. Yeah, I appreciate the, the, the additional detail and, and for folks who are interested, great place to start is right on the NIST website. I think my colleague has, has shared the, the link. I also recommend you check out this uh, video uh, from, from Jason's organization. It's about 10 minutes long and, and walks you through the, the history, the evolution of software and why we need to make software the new focal point of security, not just the data or the network. And things like that, but actually down to the software levels. We'll make sure to, and thank you, Christine, to, to get those links posted into the chat. And for everyone that's on the chat, please feel free to, to jump in on, ask any questions that, that you might have. Bill, I want to talk about this SSDF and make it relevant to APIs, because that's really what, what we're all about here on, in this community, this group. We understand that the SSDF is for developing software in general. And, and I, I grabbed this slide that I've seen you present in the past about what's the relevance of SSDF to API specifically. So can you help us walk through that? Sure. So when I'm looking back at the, the four bullet points from the previous slide, and I'm, I'm thinking just API centered focus, because that's the product that my company is developing to be sold or utilized. I need to think about specific things that impact that. So as you know, the biggest example right now is the software supply chain. And so that is a huge focal point. And how will I generate secure APIs if I'm ingesting third-party libraries that may not have heard of the SSDF, may not even attest to it, or may not even care about it. And I have to take the ownership of the security posture of that specific piece of software that I'm utilizing now. So I have to outline and define how I protect my end product when I'm utilizing these third-party libraries. And in order to do that, we can outline tasks. And I know the NIST SSDF, it, it specifically says, this is not for you to use checklists. So that's not what's expected. And I do agree with that to an extent, but I still believe checklists are very useful and we should have some checklists in some of the areas if they're needed, uh, because that will really keep it standardized and consistent throughout. But if the SSDF is helping to create a secure environment and we're asking the right questions, which is a huge part of it, how does my end API, the, the end product, how is that impacted with supply chain vulnerabilities? And can I attest to my end product meeting those needs and then be able to specify to an agency, be it the government or a savvy agency that really just cares about security, and they want to purchase my API. How can I build that trust? 
And so by doing all of these steps, we can outline this plan. We can build more trust in our end product as I certainly don't want my data leaked on the internet from using a cloud provider that isn't paying attention to their APIs and somebody scored yeah. some nasty vulnerability that was able to expose an API endpoint internally, which happens quite a lot with SSRF is one of the, the favorite yeah. ones for that. And then of course, training is probably the largest portion out of everything that is listed here and probably all of the slides. Everyone at the organization has to be aware of the initiative that is taking place, why it's important, why is it important for them and why it's important for the organization and most importantly, getting their feedback, but also training continuously. It's not a one and done training. It's not a six months. It's not a one year required training. This is incrementing, in implementing some incremental training. So as a process changes within those tasks that we've defined for a practice area, we have to do a training so that awareness remains there and everyone continues to understand what we're striving for. And so that's what I see when I look at this slide every time I stare at it is to just bring it back in is education is top priority and then making sure everyone in the organization is working together to build out the task and within the practices. Yeah. And if, if, um, if I could, I Dan, got, I got I, just to elaborate on what Bill said, I think there's some real diamonds there. When we talk about still needing checkboxes and compliance, there are activities that historically computer science majors, software development teams have not embraced. And probably the best example for that is actually doing tabletop exercises for risk modeling. I'll, I'm going to put a poll out there. Have you ever participated? in a tabletop exercise to threat model your APIs. And I, I think from my experience and the exposure of the teams that I have to Bill's point, teams need to be trained on how to actually run a tabletop exercise. They need to be educated on the outcome and the value of doing that exercise. And as I look live here at the poll, we're at 30, 37, 40, 40 no's and counting to four yeses. That's what we mean when we say DevSecOps. It's bringing the cybersecurity and the information security professionals into this development ecosystem, offering the training, helping them understand that these things that need to happen aren't really just checkbox exercises. When you look at that API, you might call that API endpoint an internal API. We don't publicly document that API. I don't think any of us believe that means it's invisible and nobody could discover it, <laughs> right? This ability to go out there and join forces with the CISO, their staff, and come together to Bill's point, it, it is so critical. And it's, it just can't be viewed as, oh, they want to slow us down. Oh, they want to check a box. Yeah. No, we're all on one team here. You're reminding me of something Bill shared the other day, and I'd love for you to elaborate on this. You have, you have these exercises that you run with your team. I think you call it think friendly mm -hmm. and it's ways to get people thinking about APIs and risks and, you know, how, you know, these, these interfaces can get used, abused, exploited in ways that they may never have, have thought of. I mean, can you talk about like some of those exercises that you run? Sure. Uh, one of the things that I implemented internally was to get people to think differently about API endpoints and by thinking differently, how we interact with it, how do we fuzz that API endpoint? Is the logic within that API endpoint working as expected? Did the developer think through all possible scenarios? Could we think through all possible scenarios? So in order to get people to focus and, and to refine their skill set to think differently in that regard. Uh, I put together a small online game with known vulnerabilities, but there's no source code available. There's no uh, tidbits online for cracking this game. So you really have to roll up your sleeves and dive into it. And so the team tackled that challenge and it, within the first 30 minutes, they already had seven findings, which was really encouraging because they were able to think differently and fuzz numerical values and manipulate, uh, you know, negative numbers when they should not have been possibly entered into the system. So driving the, the thought process through training and education 
I also got me to think differently with how to engage and interact with my team on different levels. And I think that's something that's really important for leadership to be able to do to make it entertaining and engaging. I, it looks like you might have beyond to something. There's, I see a question here. What's the URL of this game? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if you make this game available, but I think there's a market for it. <laughs> it's not currently available, but I might put something together and put it on GitHub in the near future. Yeah, that's, I think there's, I think it's fa fantastic and so cool, Jason, the, the, the impromptu poll and boy, this is not even close. looks like 85, 15 people aren't doing this and it sounds like it's much needed and you're building on your, your comment from the, the prior slide, Bill, about training. I, I got to put a little plug in here. Apologies, but we're big believers on, on, in training. I know a lot of folks on the call are familiar with API security or AppySec university. But the, the one that I want to you know, highlight, like if you're just starting on this journey and you want to understand what the risks are that come from APIs, this API security fundamentals course really seems to have hit a nerve. And what I think really is eye-opening for folks is this anatomy of real world breaches section where we talk about what happened to real companies, how those APIs got abused and used in ways that were never conceived of, never considered, and various other things. We go through the OWASP and three pillars, need for testing and, and so forth. But if you haven't taken a look at it, highly recommend that you do. And frankly, a lot of companies are now seeing this type of training as crucial to their development teams, their API product managers and the like. So it's, it, it really is absolutely necessary. So I'm seeing a lot of questions flowing in here into the chat. I really, I love to see that. So let's take a look at some of them. We got a lot of questions always on, are we sharing the, the recording? Yes, by all means. From Warren, sometimes the, the horse is out of the barn, i.e. CICD is basically getting this software out faster in real time. And now SSDF comes to town to protect our horses. Aren't we a little too late to the game with this stuff? Yeah, a bit late to the game with this stuff. Uh, which is why it was needed and why focus is needed on drawing attention to the SSDF. But I did reply to Warren in chat that the SSDF is helping to wrangle in those horses and use them efficiently. And by using it efficiently, producing more secure software from the get-go before code is even written, we've already thought about how we're going to create it securely. And so when it comes to the CICD pipelines and automation, it should become much more smoother and it in turn more efficient because of these refined processes in place. Yeah. And I would I'm extend sure, on that and thought? say that even some of the, the things that we as developers take for granted, we probably need to step back and, and pause and ask ourselves about the ramifications of that. So I like to pick on homebrew. I, I have a Mac. I do MacBook Pro development on, that's, that's my platform of choice for slinging Go, JavaScript, whatever. Um, Homebrew allows you to just go out there as a package manager and install stuff. And most developers will tell you if you're developing on a Mac, Homebrew is a necessity. Where is the governance around that? Because in security, we know the old adage, if you don't know what you have, how do you know if it's secure? You need to have that inventory. You need to know what tools you're using. And so I think to, to Warren's point, CICD has accelerated the speed of getting a new feature out into production. And we see all these case studies of the Amazons of the world that are releasing dozens of times per hour. And that's wonderful. But those pipelines have a lot of security and rules built into them. If you're going to fail. If there's going to be a CWE that's found in an API endpoint somewhere, that has to be fixed before it can be promoted even into the test environment. Those rules, that type of automation yeah. is really what the SSDF is getting at. It, it also says, for example, going back to the risk modeling, it, it says you should risk model your software. And I, I think too many software developers don't, they, how to say this right without alienating us because I'm a software developer as well. We need to recognize that we have to stop thinking about just slinging code and thinking about attacking the code that we wrote. How is somebody going to maliciously and aggressively and blatantly go after the code that I just wrote to look and see if there's a flaw that can be turned into a vulnerability? And that doesn't happen enough in our community. And so that's where I think the SSDF 
in the federal government is bringing this to the forefront. It's a great segue to Chris's question, which is what's the role of automation and shift left technology? What do you see as the leading approaches for automated security assurance, or at least automating as much as possible? And this is you know, near and dear to my heart, um, the need for automation. When you think about CICD and how quickly we're pushing code out, like real time, right? I write code and it goes live. That code goes through various gates and various assessments. We do performance tests and unit tests and functional tests and all of these kinds of things. And then when it comes to security, yeah, there's code scanners and things that look for fairly standard stuff, let's be honest, right? Like the things that cause the breaches are not the things getting caught uh, in code scanners, right? It's beyond the level of those tools. And so what are we relying on? Pen tests and red teams that beat on these APIs once or twice a year, totally out of sync with the pace of development. And so I think this question is super relevant. I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are. I'll certainly chime in <laughs> with mine, but what is the role of security? And maybe, Bill, I'll throw it to you as you probably know where I'm going with this. I think <laughs> it's interesting because I'm not one for industry keywords. I, I never have been. So whenever I see the shift left, I dismiss that phrase because I think we should always continuously focus on what improves our people, our processes, our education, and what we're doing as an organization. So we can shift right, left, center. It doesn't matter. What matters at the end of the day is, are we developing and designing secure APIs to deliver into the world? And can we do that quickly? And with automation in mind, there are great resources out there that are available. I do have a preferred product. Am I able to speak on my preferred? Yeah, go for it. What the heck? Afisec has a PI yeah, scanner yeah. that I got to see a great deal of and get into the nitty gritty and I just want to say, when you're looking at your CICD pipelines and you're looking at what value can I add that saves my engineers time and gives them more time to go and learn about emerging threats or newer things that we're facing within the industry. So within that CICD pipeline, we want automated fuzzers essentially that can heuristically go through an API using a swagger file, postman documentation, some kind of blueprint to then attack in an automated fashion against that API to find and discover many of the OWASP top 10 common threats that are there. There's a top 10 because they're so prevalent within the industry. And if we can automate scanning for those, we've covered about 89% of our attack surface. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good at Dan. <laughs> Just circling back to where are these threats coming from for APIs, right? And, and we have a brand new OWASP top 10 just came out, I think a month ago. And what's interesting from 2019 to 2023, OWASP number one and number two didn't change. And they're in somewhat of a priority order. Number one is basically authorization flaws, right? Can I log in as Dan and then access Jason's records? And number two is authentication. Am I actually Dan? And those two account for a very large percentage of the breaches that we see in the real world. And it's not to, to discard the other eight. They're very relevant and you need to go beyond the OWASP top 10. And, and indeed you can automate testing for these things. If you're interested in it, come talk to me. We can tell you a lot about it, but automation is key because we are pushing re um, code out faster and faster. And we can't wait for that next pen test that comes around three, four months from now. Yeah. And I'll extend on that and say that. Just linking this all back to the theme of the day, right? The SSDF and the horses. Thank you, Warren, for that analogy. The SSDF has a task. And in that task, RV 3.2, you can look it up. It says, analyze the root causes over time to identify platforms, such as a particular secure coding practice not being followed consistently. And, and, and it's such a sound advice. Yeah, gosh, it's been number one and number two for years now. How is it not changing? The only reason it's not changing is because of us developers, right? We're not looking at this and we're not looking at our code reviews. We're not putting in place checks and balances and automations. For example, I think somebody made a comment in, in the chat had already scrolled by, but take open API. You've got a documentation of what the API looks like if you're doing a standard web service style API, right? Anytime that document changes, that should be a flag that says, okay, hold on. Now we need 
in our, our GitLab or our harness or whatever tool we're using, we need to have three sets of eyes, not the normal two. Go look at this. We need to go do a new tabletop exercise specifically on the APIs that have been introduced or changed, not the whole thing. And I think this is the type of practice that people will dismiss, but we're really talking about 30 minutes over the course of your sprint, right? This is not a massive investment in time. It's having that automation and the checks and balances, which ironically are also called out, right? PO4.1 says define criteria for software security checks and tracks throughout the SDLC. Yeah. If your API changes the open API spec, do a tabletop yeah. on just the Delta. 30 minutes, capture the findings, do some root cause. If you're breached, you're off to the races. We should be able to get number one and number two off the list. But we as a community have to step up and go, enough is enough. It, it's, gosh, the, these questions are fantastic and we won't have time for them all. I, mean, I think we're going to have to do another session, guys. But uh, I see this one from Niha. From a compliance point of view, how does SSDF help for regulatory compliance like PCI and throw in whatever you want, SOC 2 and HIPAA and, and you name it. And I'll jump in here and say, if you do SSDF, it doesn't make you compliant, but it sure helps, right? It's going to make you think, it's going to make you organize, it's going to have you create the policies and the tests and the infrastructure and the culture that will drive compliance, right? PCI compliance will be a byproduct of doing the things that SSDF encourages. So it's really about creating that culture in your organization and uh, not just a specific checkbox. I did these things and you know, now I'm PCI compliance. I'm going to ask, I'm going to um, answer this question um, from Owusu. What's the best way to create an inventory? Geez, that comes up a whole lot. I have my opinions here. Jason, you talked about challenges with that at DOD wanting to implement things like gateways and so forth. What are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, so from an API perspective, I believe that API gateways are an amazing resource to put into your architecture and your stack. Not only are they going to give you the opportunity to manage the life cycle of an endpoint, an API, uh, but they're also going to give you statistics on things like usage. So if you adopt something like a straggler fig pattern and you want to sunset a particular API endpoint, you need to make sure that nobody's actually calling it for say two weeks or three weeks or whatever your threshold is. If you don't have a way to collect that data, to have that visibility, you're going to be hurting. So to me, one of the best ways to gain the inventory, the visibility of usage, adoption, et cetera, is to make sure that your stack has some sort of an API gateway from the get-go when you're designing the system or get one in there as fast as you can. You really hit a nerve there, certainly with me. I see a lot of security teams, you know, start, we don't even know what APIs we have, right? To me, that reeks of a governance problem, right? Like how is it that APIs are being deployed outside of a standard process? All right. So start with defining a standard process. And I think SSDF goes to this. Don't have 101 ways to publish an API, have one way. And it all goes into a gateway and it's all centrally managed and controlled. And if security teams, if you don't know what APIs you got, rather than stuffing sensors all over the network and trying to back door your way into finding and, and discovering APIs, go talk to the app dev teams. I guarantee you it's not unknown to the organization. It's unknown to you. So go have those conversations and do implement tools that will give you central control and central visibility to all of your APIs. Cheryl's question here, do you have suggestions for maturing company culture and adopt a more security first attitude? I'm actually going to go to you, Bill, first, and, and I bet Jason, you've got thoughts here. I certainly do as well. As a guy on the front lines, how do you create that culture? I radically change the environment and not often, but on a continuous basis. So I like to theme things out, think differently, work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Be lazy is a good theme. That one always gets a lot of laughs, but I prefer to invoke thought as opposed to implant thought. I, I very much recommend hearing your recommendations and suggestions for how the global team can better achieve our objectives. And then as a team, we work together to create that change that's necessary to adapt to industry changes. So it's not 
a once and done thing. It's a continuous process. So if you want a strong culture wrapped around security, uh, as Jason said, and Dan alluded to earlier in this webinar, get with your developers. And I wouldn't stop there. I would get with every single team at the company. I would, I want to have a conversation with them. I want to know what they know about security. I want to know how I can help them learn more about security because at the end of the day, the more they're aware, the less that I have to do. And, and that works out well. How about at a, at an organization like DOD or, or other places you've been, Jason, like, how do you create that culture? Yeah, it, it starts with finding the right level of support from the top that says, Hey, look, this is important to us as a leadership team. This is important to our shareholders or in some place like the DOD, this is important to the warfighter. We want our sailors and soldiers to come home and be back with their families at the end of a deployment. Uh, and in fact, even the SSDF recognizes that this cultural aspect is quite important. Uh, it, it stipulates as one of the 42 tasks, identify who that champion is in the upper management that's going to be there and say, look, development team, product manager, product owner, I got your back. You've identified something that is a, a flaw that is significant, could lead to a breach. You need time to go fix that. Bring that to me. I'm going to be the one to go over to business development folks, over to the sales and marketing teams, over to whoever I need to as your champion in the executive team to say, we've got to prioritize that we've got to do this. So I think training from the boardroom to the team room, that's how Digital Triad Group, we always talk about this. You've got to get the boardroom and the C-suite and the leadership team to understand and buy in and find your champion there. And that will help as the grassroots movement comes up from the bottom with the developers, you've got that top cover. I appreciate that. And I'll just add my own two cents here before we wrap things up and my goodness, what a great uh, topic. So many good questions. I do think this is worthy of, of a further conversation, but we've run a lot of CISO roundtables and talked to a lot of folks about how did they go about creating that culture. And one little tactical thing that, that we heard over and over again was implementing or, or integrating what they call security champions into the development organization. So really breaking down these walls between security and engineering and, and development and so forth. Just put some of your people right in there, make them part of the, the team, make them integrate them into the, the, the daily life of, of engineering teams and, and, and the application developers. Um, something like that can really change the communication, the, the collaboration that happens between these organizations. And it's clear, it's just so critical that that, that barrier come down between security and, and development. Um, Wish we had a lot more time to get through a lot more of these questions. Very grateful to you, you, Jason and Bill. Really appreciate you both coming and joining us for this conversation. Highly recommend everyone go check them out. You can find them on LinkedIn, go visit their websites. We will be posting this recording on YouTube shortly. So if you want to come back and, and revisit any of this, but thanks to everyone in the chat, fantastic questions. This has probably been the most animated group that we've had on one of our sessions. Really appreciate that. Thanks a lot and stay tuned for future events. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.